gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to thank the panelists for uh, coming today. Uh, the thing that I was struck by is that there does seem to be uh, some similarities, um, a commonality that all of you uh, agree on at least some of the steps uh, that we might want to consider moving forward, uh, or at least there's a consensus among you, and I know that there's clearly some differences. Um, my first uh, question is for uh, Ms. Wartell. Uh, you talked about uh, a yield spread analysis, and you used that to conclude that investors in Europe view covered bonds as having essentially a government guarantee. Um, but I, I guess the part I'm trying to understand is that yield spread was actually uh, smaller than the yield spread between U.S. Treasuries and the Fannie and Freddie debt, which does have a government guarantee. Isn't it really a statement by those investors that they're admitting that there is um, less risk in those covered bonds because the uh, banks that originated them have continued to have skin in the game, and they believe when somebody that originates a mortgage has skin in the game, they're not going to let themselves lose money versus the system we have where you can originate and sell off 100 percent. Isn't that, uh, isn't that another way to look at, at the view? And, uh, and obviously, there's no, it's all speculation, it too, because we're just looking at a yield analysis instead of really interviewing investors that have invested in these. Uh, it, it's my, uh, let's put aside the, the analysis of the spreads, because I think obviously different people can interpret it different ways. But I do think that it is safe to say, both uh, as you said, that uh, the, there is particular collateral behind the covered bonds, and the lender, the investors understand that they have that, and that they believe that those institutions uh, um, uh, in most of those countries benefit from an implied government guarantee. Thank you. Uh, do you think, uh, Ms. Wartell, that the uh, retention of risk leads to less risky behavior by those institutions that have skin in the game? Uh, I, I generally have supported that lending institutions should retain uh, risk in uh, have skin in the game in, in their loans, as the uh, Dodd-Frank legislation also would require. Sure. Thank you. And this, the second question I've got also for Ms. Wartell, uh, how do you explain the 30-year fixed mortgage in Denmark if you think that a covered bond won't lead to a, a uh, fixed rate mortgage here in the United States. Clearly, it seems that it's a market requirement that consumers in Denmark, consumers in the United States have demanded those products, and therefore the market has provided them. Uh, actually, I think we're, uh, there are two different arguments that I've made that are uh, uh, being conflated in this case. I, uh, uh, Denmark has provided through the covered bond mechanism long-term fixed rate mortgages. My point is that I think if you have a purely private market, uh, uh, I think the appeal of covered bonds for most of our financial institutions under the U.S. regulatory scheme is very different. It won't likely be the primary mechanism of fi funding. Um, and I also think that here we will end up with short-term uh, debt. But it's not the uh, covered bond that I argue that won't produce 30-year fixed rate mortgages. It's the fact that if we have the uh, problem with the, the FDIC. I, I if we don't have the backstop for the investment. Okay, thank you. Could the other panelists uh, comment on their thoughts quickly on retention of risk and, and what that would mean uh, for, for the marketplace? Uh, Congressman, I have worked on uh, introducing risk retention into the mortgage markets for 15 years. I think it's an extremely useful and important idea. It's one of many ideas, but it's a very useful one. And I think the advantage of the covered bond, which you cite, uh, that there's 100 percent credit risk in the game for the credit bond issuer is also extremely important in understanding how these bonds work. Uh, I would just echo the, uh, the comments of my colleague. Thank you. Uh, and I, was, I, I think retention of risk is an important thing in the marketplace, but I also believe there was considerable retention of risk prior to the crisis. In fact, most of the 400-some subprime lenders that went out of business were because they were forced to buy back the piece that they had. Uh, so skin in the game is important, but it isn't a cure-all. Sure. I would also argue that you know, one of the things that should be considered going forward if we're going to keep a Freddie and Fannie model is to keep them out, get them out of the guarantee business where they simply sell off the MBS. They don't guarantee the credit risk because all three-fourths of their losses has come about because they retained that risk and the investor did not take it. So we have lots of retention of risk. Hasn't always worked that well. Sometimes it has, sometimes it hasn't, but it's, it's not a cure-all. Thank you. Uh, now for the whole panel, just going across, uh, you know, the, the focus of a lot of your... Uh, testimony was on covered bonds. Uh, 
uh, are there approaches somewhere between what we're doing today and covered bonds? Are there uh, other approaches that people are talking about, reinsurance or any other approach outside of, of just the two approaches that we've heard today? And I'll I know just, that we don't have much time, so. I'll just uh, go 10, 10 seconds, oh, well. seconds for if you can give a. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say very quickly that I think you can can have a large amount of lending that is portfolio based, not in a covered bond way, even though that is portfolio based. Anybody? My answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.